We are busy with chapter 8, internal forced convection. Uh, we've done the first three paragraphs. With the previous lecture, we've started with 8.4, the general thermal analysis. And the most of this lecture, we're also going to spend on this paragraph. So spending two lectures on this one paragraph must tell you something. Very, very important concepts that you really need to understand very, very well. Okay. And maybe, if we are lucky, we will also start with paragraph 8.4 on laminar flowing tubes, which will be followed by paragraph 8.6, turbulent flow in tubes. Okay, so let's go back to paragraph 8.4 and we revise a little bit of the most important concepts and the results that we've discussed with the previous lecture. Okay, and we've said that in general, there are two different cases in heat transfer. The constant heat flux and the constant surface temperature. And I would advise you to use two columns in your, in your book now, just so that you can see the comparison of the two cases very well. On the left, do the constant heat flux, and next to it, the constant surface temperature. Okay, with the constant heat flux, we've looked at the case where, as the name says, we are heating a tube or a duct with a constant heat flux. So, the number of watts per square meter, or the number of watts per meter, is constant. And that is equal to the inlet temperature Ti, the outlet temperature Te, and that is the heat flux Qs in watts per square meter. If we look at the graph in terms of how the temperature looks as a function of x, where L is the length of the tube, then it's very easy to show that the mean temperature increases linearly. Okay. So this is Tm. The temperature on the inside of the tube. Okay. Let's maybe, just to show it in colors, Use yellow for that. And the wall temperature is going to do, we've proved it, is going to be parallel towards that temperature if the flow is fully developed. Okay. So in this region, the heat transfer coefficient is going to be a constant. The heat transfer coefficient is a constant, the flow is fully developed, thermally and hydrodynamically, totally fully developed, and this distance is delta T. Okay. And in general, still underneath this graph, we can say that the temperature as a function of X which we can also call the mean temperature as a function of x, is equal to Ti plus the heat flux multiplied by the perimeter divided by the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp multiplied by x. Okay, so this is the equation of the straight line, the line in yellow, and the wall, which is going to be at the higher temperature, is going to do something like that. And delta T is equal to the heat flux divided by the heat transfer coefficient. And that is equal to Ts minus Tm. Okay. Ts minus Tm. Okay, so just in terms of nomenclature, let's, let's just put in there a Ts to indicate this is the surface temperature. So it is clear that we can get that temperature there 
But how do we get the temperatures here in the developing region? In the developing section, delta T is now going to be the heat flux divided by the heat transfer coefficient which is a function of x, it's not a constant. So if you know what the heat transfer coefficient is in the developing region as a function of x, then you can calculate the surface temperature also. That's easy, isn't it? Okay. Let's look at the following case, which is now on the second column next to this one. The case of a constant surface temperature. Ts is equal to a constant. Constant surface temperature, Ts is, Ts is equal to a constant. Now in this case, again schematically, if that is our tube or duct, of course we are busy with internal flow, and usually with internal flow we've got a tube or a duct or internal type of geometry. Now in this case, this wall is everywhere equal to Ts. Okay. Normally, we will get this situation where on the outside we've got condensation or evaporation. Condensation or evaporation or boiling, we've got very, very high heat transfer coefficients. If we have very, very high heat transfer coefficients, the resistance is very, very small. And at the same time, during condensation and evaporation, the temperature remains constant. Okay. So therefore, constant temperature of everything on the outside, small resistance, gives us a constant wall temperature. Okay. And yesterday we did the derivation, so we do not, we're not going to repeat it all now. But if that is the length of the tube as a function of x, then the surface temperature in this case is now the easy one to solve because it is given, it is a constant. Okay. While the mean temperature on the inside looks like this. Ti and Te. Okay, so the surface temperature is a constant, that is easy, it's given, and we have also derived the fact that the lin of Ts minus Te divided by Ts minus Ti is equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by T multiplied by L divided by MCP, or it is also equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by the mass flow rate and Cp. This is equation one, and I'm going to come back to that equation a little bit later. Okay. So this is part of the equation that came out during the derivation. And I'm writing it there because I'm going to refer back to this equation. And then we've used this equation to solve the mean temperature. So the mean temperature as a function of x is equal to the surface temperature minus the surface temperature minus Ti e to the minus h the area divided by the mass flow rate Cp multiplied by x. And I think maybe if you can't see it very well, let me rather write it here. The mean temperature is a function of x is equal to Ts minus Ts minus Ti e to the minus Hp divided by the mass flow Cp multiplied by x. Okay. So we can see that this temperature of Tm 
has this term in, which obviously makes it a nonlinear relationship, strongly nonlinear one. Okay. Okay, now this term is also known as the NTUs, the number of transfer units. It's a non-dimensionalized term. We can write it as the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area divided by the mass flow rate and the CP value. Okay, P multiplied by X, P multiplied by X, the perimeter multiplied by X gives us the surface at any specific point and if we want to know it for the whole tube it is obviously P multiplied by L and that is equal to the area. So that area is equal to P multiplied by L or Px. <coughs> okay, and this NTU gives us an indication of the effectiveness of a heat exchanger. Okay, so listen carefully. The NTUs gives us an indication of the effectiveness of a heat exchanger. So, typically if the NTUs are larger than 5, if the NTUs is larger than 5, then the outlet temperature is going to be approximately equal to the surface temperature. What does that mean? It means on this curve, these two lines start to touch each other. Obviously it can't cross, but they start to touch each other. Okay, let's look at an example. Look at an example. And the example is we have flow with an inlet temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, a surface temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, and it is constant, the surface temperature. And let's determine the outlet temperature determine the outlet temperature. Okay. okay, so if we look at this equation, Tm, Tm is the temperature, the mean temperature at any station as a function of x. So we can say the outlet temperature or the mean temperature at x equal to L okay, is equal to the outlet temperature, is equal to the surface temperature which is 100 minus the inlet temperature which is 20 divided by E to the minus NTUs. So the heat transfer coefficient is not given, the perimeter is not given, the mass flow rate and the CP. It is just a general problem. Okay. So now let's go and solve this as a function of the NTUs and we see what is the outlet temperature in degrees Celsius. Okay. So if the NTUs is equal to 0.01, so it's very very small, then the outlet temperature is going to be 20.8. Okay. So which is not that good, I mean the wall temperature is 100, Inlet temperature is 20, outlet temperature is going to be 20.8. So it's not a very effective heat exchanger. You agree? Okay. Mm. Uh, we copy the TM. Shouldn't it be TS minus one Sorry, I've calculated. Ah, I see what you're yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, TE is equal to the surface temperature, which is 100 minus. The surface temperature which is 100 minus inlet temperature which is 20 e to the minus into use. Okay. Okay. So for an into U of 0.01, the outlet temperature is going to be 20.8. For an into U of equal to 1, the temperature is going to be 70.6. It is starting to look better. Okay. If the into use is equal to 5. Coming back to what I've said here, 
then the outlet temperature is going to be 99.5. Okay? And if the NTUs is equal to 10, the outlet temperature is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. So many of you are doing designs at the moment. Some of my own students are busy designing heat exchangers, and there are many more of you who are also designing heat exchangers. So if you look at this, many of you would say, well, well, it's easy. Let me, let me choose an NTU of 10, because then I can get an outlet temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. But what is the implication of that? The implication is huge in terms of area. Okay. We can see the NTUs is strongly dependent on the area. The heat transfer coefficient, if it's fully developed, flow is going to be a constant. The mass flow rate is going to be a constant. And the CP is also, for all practical purposes, going to be a constant. So the NTUs is associated with area. So this is a small area, and this is a large area. Okay. So the result is, if you increase the NTUs from 5 to 10, that you're going to double the area just for getting another 0.5 degrees Celsius, which is very, very expensive. Even designing heat exchangers with an NTU of 5, you're already going to see is going to be very expensive. Any questions? Okay. If you've used the two columns, then you can go back to one column now again. Okay. And we are still, but we are still continuing with this case. Ts is equal to a constant. Okay. Okay, so from equation one, this equation that I've told you we're going to use, let's just write it down again, which is the lin of Ts minus Te divided by Ts minus Ti is equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by the mass flow rate and CP. Okay. Let's solve MCP. Okay. So if we solve MCP, then it is equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface divided by the lin of Ts minus Te divided by Ts minus Ti. <coughs> but we also know that the heat transfer rate is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. So if we take this MCP and we replace it in there, do the substitution, substitution, then it is equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by the lin of Ts minus Te divided by Ts minus Te, Ti, sorry, multiplied by T outlet minus T inlet. Okay, now we start seeing a lot of temperatures. <clears throat> so let's make it a little bit more neat. And we change these two, make it Ti minus Te, then we get rid of the negative sign. So it is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area multiplied by Ti minus Te divided by the lin of Ts minus Te divided by Ts minus Ti. Okay. 
supposed to have an area in it? I beg your pardon? Isn't your equation for large Q supposed to have an area in it? Mass or rate CP? No, no. No, no. Th this is, that is with the heat transfer coefficient. Okay. Remember, MCP delta T is our one equation of getting the heat transfer rate. The other equation is Q is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area multiplied by delta T. And this whole lecture is, or two lectures, is actually about this delta T. Okay. So we're moving into that direction. The, there you see the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area. And we're going to write this as the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area multiplied by LMTD. LMTD. Okay. Now what is this LMTD? LMTD is the lock mean temperature difference. The lock mean temperature difference. Okay, note that delta Ti is the surface temperature minus the inlet temperature. Okay, I shouldn't have erased this. Let me just put it in again. That is Ts, Ts, Ti, and Te. Okay, so delta Ti Delta Ti is the difference between Ts and Ti. You agree? Okay. Let's call that equation 2. Then also Delta Te is equal to Ts minus Te. Equation 3. And if we take equation 2 minus equation 3, then we can show that Ti minus Te is equal to delta Te minus delta Ti. Okay. okay. Now let's start using some different colors here. Okay, Ts minus Ti Ts minus Ti. Do you see that one there? Okay. Then Ti. Uh, sorry, I should have actually should have been this one. Ts minus Ti. Okay. Okay, then Ti minus Te. <coughs> Ti minus Te. Okay, let me use a green one. For Ts minus Te. You see all the terms, okay? So, if we do this substitution, if we do this substitution, the LMTD, the lock mean temperature difference is equal to delta T outlet minus delta T inlet divided by the lin of delta T outlet divided by delta T inlet. And you can show that it is also equal to delta T inlet minus delta T outlet divided by the lin of delta T inlet minus delta T outlet. Okay, the lock mean temperature difference is a very, very important concept. Okay, so it means that if we've got two different surfaces, and in this case I'm showing the surfaces as not one of them a constant or the lines as if it is not for a constant heat flux. So it can be any surface and any stream. Doesn't matter. And the directions also doesn't matter. 
Okay. So the LMTD says that let's take this temperature difference, delta Ti, the inlet, and we take that temperature difference, delta Te. Okay. And the LMTD, the LMTD is equal to this temperature difference minus that de temperature difference divided by the lim of those two ratios. So it's a very easy equation to remember if you want to remember it. Okay. Let's take a very simple example. We've got a wall. We, the wall on this side is equal to 100 degrees Celsius and on that side it is equal to 80 degrees Celsius. Then we've got a fluid flowing over the wall with an inlet temperature of 10 and an outlet temperature of 40. Okay. So this delta T at the inlet the delta T at the inlet is equal to 100 minus 10 is equal to 90. Okay? This delta T at the outlet is equal to 80 minus 40 is equal to 40. Okay. So the LMTD is equal to 90 minus 40 divided by the lin of 90 divided by 40. And that is equal to 61.66 degrees Celsius. Okay. So where does this lecture go to? This lecture goes to the fact that although I've shown this example as not a constant wall temperature goes to the fact that if you have a constant wall temperature if you have a constant wall temperature then most of us would have said if I want to calculate the, the heat transfer rate I would have taken this temperature minus the bulk temperature okay and because of the exponential nature of that we are making quite a large error Okay. So we need a better indication of what is the average temperature difference. And that is being given by the LMTD. The LMTD gives us a more accurate representation of the temperature difference. Okay. So, write it down. For a constant surface, for a constant surface temperature, Use LMTD and not, not the surface temperature minus the bulk temperature. Okay, because this bulk temperature is problematic. If the tube is very short, then it would actually be not such a large error, but the longer the tube and the larger the ink used, the larger the error. Okay, let's look at another example. Okay, the example is I've got water. The inlet temperature of 15 degrees Celsius and a mass flow rate of 0.3 kilograms per second flowing through a tube. The tube temperature is 120 degrees Celsius and it is steam condensing. Okay, so we've got steam condensing on the outside of the tube and it is condensing at 120 degrees Celsius. Okay, the heat transfer coefficient, the average heat transfer coefficient is given as 800 watts per square meter degree Celsius. The tube diameter is 25 millimeters. 25 millimeters. And they ask us what should the length be? How long should this tube be 
so that this outlet temperature is equal to 115 degrees Celsius. Okay. So let me repeat the problem. We've got water with an inlet temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, mass flow rate of 0.3 kilograms per second, which is being pumped through a tube. The tube is in steam. We've got steam condensing on the outside. The condensing temperature of the steam is 120 <coughs> degrees Celsius. Condensing temperature of the steam is 120 degrees Celsius. They do not give us the tube temperature. Okay. But the fact that we know we've got steam condensing on the outside, as I've mentioned, high heat transfer coefficients, and also on the TS diagram, remember, if we've got steam condensing at 120 degrees Celsius, then the temperature during condensation stays constant. So everywhere here on the outside, we've got steam at 120 degrees Celsius, high heat transfer coefficient, low resistance, and therefore we can assume that that wall temperature is equal to 120 degrees Celsius. So it's a constant wall temperature problem. Okay, the heat transfer coefficient is 800 average, the diameter is 25, the outlet temperature of the water is 115, okay, which is higher than 100 degrees Celsius. So that can only be if this water is at a high pressure, higher than atmospheric pressure, which is possible. Okay. So we have to calculate the length so that the outlet temperature is 115 <laughs> degrees Celsius. Okay. So let's look at the bulk temperature. The bulk temperature is equal to the inlet temperature, which is 15, the outlet temperature, which is 115 divided by 2, which is equal to 65 degrees Celsius. Okay. In table A9, at the back of the textbook of Sengel and Gujar, you can get the properties of water at 65 degrees Celsius, and there the CP will be equal to 4187 joules per kilogram Kelvin, and the viscosity which will be equal to 0.26 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per meter second. The viscosity is equal to 0.26 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 kilograms meters per second. Okay, the thing that we can do here is we can immediately calculate the heat transfer rate. And the heat transfer rate is equal to <coughs> Heat transfer rate is equal to Q is equal to MCP multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. Of course, the outlet and inlet temperatures are given, the mass flow rate and the CP are all given. So the mass flow rate is equal to 0.3, CP is equal to 4187, the outlet temperature they want it to be 115 degrees Celsius. The inlet temperature is 15. So the heat transfer rate, to make that possible, means 125.6 kilowatts of heat need to be added to the water. So what we have here is a constant wall temperature problem. If we draw it schematically, it would mean that the wall 
would be at 120 degrees Celsius. Surface is 120 degrees Celsius. The water, the water stream is going to come in at 15 The outlet temperature is going to be 115. Okay. Okay, and if I would like to connect these two points, that would be the bulk temperature, T bulk, which we've calculated as 65 degrees Celsius. Okay. So we can say that the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area multiplied by the wall temperature minus the bulk temperature. Okay. The heat transfer coefficient is equal to uh, sorry, let's we've got the heat transfer rate. The heat transfer rate is 125.6 kilowatts is equal to the heat transfer coefficient which is equal to 800 the area would be equal to pi multiplied by the diameter which is 25 millimeters multiplied by L multiplied by the surface temperature which is 120 minus the bulk temperature which is 65 from which we can solve that the length should be 30, 36.3 meters. Yeah. Are you happy with that? Good. I was so scared you're going to believe me. Okay. So what you should do is you should write here the wrong approach. That is wrong. Okay. I specifically done it because I want to show you what is, going to, what is going to be the result if we do it correctly. Okay, so if we want to do it correctly, then we say that the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area multiplied by the LMTD. That is what these two lectures were all about, the LMTD, getting the LMTD and understanding the rationale for it. Okay. The LMTD, let's calculate the LMTD. Okay, the LMTD is at the inlet 120 minus 15. 120 minus 15, that temperature difference minus this temperature difference which is 120 minus 115. Okay, divided by the limb of those two terms. The limb of 120 minus 15 divided by 120 minus 115. And this gives us an LMTD of 32.85 degrees Celsius. Okay, now that doesn't mean that if we now take this temperature difference there, that that is going to be 32 degrees Celsius. This LMTD tells us if we do the integration of this whole temperature line, then we're going to end up with an average temperature there, so that that temperature is going to be 32.85 degrees Celsius. So, if we now calculate the heat transfer rate, the right way, it's the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area, multiplied by LMTD.
Heat transfer rate is equal to 125.6 kilowatts. It's equal to the heat transfer coefficient, which is 800, multiplied by the surface area. Surface area will be pi multiplied by the diameter multiplied by the length that we want to determine multiplied now by the LMTD which is 32.85 degrees Celsius and if we do the calculation now of the required length it is almost double that 60.86 meters Okay, we are not finished yet with this problem. There is still another part that I want to add to it. Any questions? Uh, excuse me, sir. How accurate is it to use the T bulb for the properties of the water to get that machine? How accurate is that? It, it's a good question. So, what he's asking now is we've calculated the properties now at this point, but actually we should calculate it at that point. You're correct. You can go and recalculate it. Go and sort of calculate a new bulk temperature, do, redo the calculation. But what you will see typically with water, if you've got temperature differences of 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, the CP and the density is not going to change that significantly. Okay, but you're supposed to iterate it. Okay, any more questions? Okay, something else that we also need to also always think of when we do a calculation like that is. Although it has been given to us that the average heat transfer coefficient is 800, there's something important that we should know, and that is, is the flow fully developed? Not. And for what part of the tube? Okay. And to do that, we have to calculate the Reynolds number, as you know. And with the previous lecture, we have derived the Reynolds number in terms of the mass flow rate. Okay, I'm not going to put in all the values now because otherwise I'm not going to finish, but you've got all the values here. So if you go and calculate the Reynolds number, you'll see it is equal to 57,000. Okay, what does it mean? It means the flow is turbulent. Okay, it's turbulent. But more than that, what it means is that if we look at this tube of us, which now is going to be 60.86 meters. Okay. The flow is going to be fully developed within 10 diameters. 10 diameters is, the diameter is 25 millimeters, so within 250 millimeters, <coughs> the flow is going to be fully developed. Do you agree? Okay. So if we think of what the heat transfer coefficient does as a function of x, then for this specific problem, for this specific problem, we know that, and this is not even to scale, that the heat transfer coefficient there is going to be large, and then it is going to be decreased until the flow is fully developed. Okay. So for more than 60.6 meters, the heat transfer coefficient is going to be an average of 800 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay. So we are safe in terms of our calculation. But let's suppose we had the other, other way around. Let's suppose we had a problem where, <coughs> in terms of if that is the tube, it is only fully developed 250 millimeters from the end. Okay, so the heat transfer coefficient is actually doing something like that and it's only for this last part where it is going to be 800. Okay, would you be very worried about your calculation? Will you? Why not? Why not? 
I beg your pardon? You need to get the age of the patient. Yes, you need to get, but in terms of your calculation, your, your prediction of 60.86 meters, that is how long you, get, you need to get the outlet temperature of 115. Would you be worried about the result? Okay. Okay, the answer is no. Okay, because let's suppose if you do the integration and you get the average heat transfer coefficient as 900. Okay. If you go and redo the calculation of Q is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area, LMTD, and now you, ne you need, you use 900 for the heat transfer coefficient. Okay. Okay. Then the length is now going to be 54.1 meters. Okay. okay. So what it means, ladies and gentlemen, is that normally we are quite happy to use that value because it gives us conservative results. Okay. It gives us conservative results. The heat transfer coefficient can only be higher if it is higher, it is in our favor and gives us a sort of a, a nice safety factor. Okay, for in case we've got scaling on the tubes or something like that later on. <laughs> okay, so the rule of thumb, not that you should try to remember it, is that the heat transfer coefficient for fully developed flow gives us conservative results. But you should be able to see it out of the numbers. Okay, thank you very much.